really good to be here this morning with you. I'm going to, I'll introduce myself again, and I'm going to read the passage, and hopefully in that time, you will adjust to my English or my American. Uh, so I am here on vacation, not my holiday, my vacation, uh, to visit Barry. As has already been said, we are friends from Lithuania. We've known each other a long time, and it's been great to visit, uh, to just uh, explore this part of the US and uh, there's lots more to explore but it's been really good to be here it's been it's really good to be here with you this morning um, I'm from a church in East London in a very very densely populated part of East London the most densely populated part of the United Kingdom is very growth in the numbers of people who are there very very diverse multicultural we definitely definitely don't have rolling fields um, outside our church building um, but it's really good to be here with you and um, it's great that the gospel message is for densely populated cities but also more rural countryside um, areas and it's great that we have the same gospel to share across the nations the passage i'm going to read and that preach through is from a sermon that i gave at my church a few weeks ago we've been going through mark's gospel hence why um, i chose this I trust that God will speak to you um, through this. I don't know anything about you as a church. I know Barry. Um, Barry hasn't told me much about you as a church. So I trust that God will speak to you through his word this morning. Um, if there are things that challenge you, then I trust that that's from the Lord. It's not from, it's not from me. I pray that I will encourage you as we read through God's word. My prayer is that as we go through this, we will see Jesus and we will love him more what he has done for us and what he is doing in this world as we look at three stories from the life of Jesus. They fit together, I think. Um, Mark has put them together to show us the community of Jesus, what his community looks like, the people who are going to come and follow Jesus, what we would call the church, who those people are and what they're like. If you know much about Mark's gospel, you'll see there's a big emphasis on the king, Jesus being the king. And we'll see this is a kind of the king's community as we read. I'm going to pray and then we'll read the passage. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is given to us. I thank you that wherever we are from, whoever we are, whether we are young or old, rich or poor, whether we're from the US or the UK, your word speaks to your people. We pray it would speak to us this morning. We pray it would be a lamp to our feet. We pray it would be honey to our lips. And we pray that it would be more precious than gold to us. We pray your blessing on the reading of your word and on the preaching of your word. And we pray for your spirit to be at work in our hearts and our minds this morning. Amen. So please turn to Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 40. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 40. And it probably says a man with leprosy at the top. That's the section we're going to start with. A man with leprosy came to him, that's Jesus, and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell anyone about this, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. 
some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the man, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking. He said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many collectors were him, his disciples, but there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Amen. There's three stories here, and my plan is to just talk a bit about the stories, to help bring them to life for us, and then to talk about what they The first one in the man meeting the man with leprosy is that the king's community. It says in verse 41, filled with compassion. He has the same compassion. The same word is used here of the father in the prodigal, the story of the prodigal. And Jesus has love and care and delight to this leper. Someone who is
kind of community, Jesus loves that person and cares for them, welcomes them in. Jesus reached out his hand touches him. Jesus, the one who is ultimately pure, ultimately the one who can, the one who can approach uh, God. He touches him and does The next surprise is Jesus says, I am willing. The leprosy left him and he was cured. If you read through Leviticus, the worse, then they can declare you to be clean. Then for about seven days, you take part in various ceremonies and then you can be accepted to the community here jesus heals him with a word he shows his authority over creation he shows his authority as the ultimate high priest he shows his authority as god to bring healing and cleansing to this person And the leprosy immediately was gone. We see in this short encounter that Jesus, or the sickness ends with Jesus. Being outcast ends with Jesus. Cleansing comes with Jesus. This man gets... ...that we see here. But there's also a surprise from the man. He's told by Jesus to go to see the priests. What Jesus says to him. He doesn't do what we're told in Leviticus. Birds and lambs and offer sacrifice uh, to God. Instead, he goes around telling people what's happened to him. And on the surface, it looks like he's, made his, he's actually made Jesus' job harder because Jesus doesn't, uh, says, um, places. We see here that this man's job, rather than going around, previously around his his area shouting unclean unclean which is what he had to do the transformation everywhere he went would have been i am now clean i am now clean jesus has made me clean but there's another community is a place of compassion it shows us that the king's community is a points to sacrifice on his own Jesus temple he's pointing him
community is about welcoming the outcast, but it's about a community of salvation. Jesus forgives sins. It sounds like a really obvious thing to probably say to you this morning. Jesus saves, Jesus forgives sins. One of the fundamental things we believe as Christians. But this story is a great reminder, one that we probably know very well, but a great reminder of the importance of that and how that is completely central to what Jesus teaches his people. Imagine the scene. Imagine uh, this room is completely full of people. There are, we're still in Lebanon County, aren't we? I'm still, I'm learning the geography. Imagine that people from all over because this amazing teacher Jesus is here. He's been healing various people, healing the blind. And then there are four guys, they, they have this friend, let's call him John. He cannot walk. He needs major treatment, the kind of treatment that you would spend hours but they can't get in this room is completely full so they climb on the roof i don't know if you've got a flat roof
pretty much like me to find out. They're not in a building this time, they're outside by a lake. Um, he's teaching them. It's them to turn and trust in Jesus and follow him. The tax collector's booth, Levi, son of Alphaeus. are basically the enemy. Who we would probably in our hearts hate, probably people who we would avoid ever seeing, the people we least like. One, we're obviously all aware, hopefully, of the situation in Ukraine and the war is taking place there. One of the people that this is a little bit like are people who might be in, in occupied parts of Ukraine who have allied themselves to the Russian invaders, who are making money from the invasion. What they're doing. Perhaps the closest we can think of. And you think of the pain that it would cause you to see someone you know ally themselves with the enemy, taking your money, making themselves rich of what they're doing. The hatred you would feel to that person, the anger you would feel to that person. And yet Jesus comes into this situation. He's walking along the lake. You're excited because you're hearing Jesus teach and you've, you've heard him, perhaps you've seen the miracle of him uh, raising this man up from his paralysis. Jesus says to this guy who's a traitor, follow me. Completely surprised. It should be completely surprising. It should be almost ridiculous to us. The next surprise is that the man does. He obeys immediately. Levi got up and followed him. Then Jesus goes to his house. This man is probably pretty rich. He's been making money off his collecting his taxes. He's probably taking quite a lot extra on the side. He's probably got quite a nice house. And then there's a lot of people suddenly turn up um, in his house. Again, the, tax, the, the Pharisees and the, the religious leaders want to go and find out what is this all about? This is our opportunity. We are going to nail Jesus for doing this. He is allying himself with our enemies. This is the point at which we, we're going to get Jesus. And we're going to prove that this whole Jesus movement and this fraud, how could anybody possibly follow this Jesus? These teachers of the law, they say, why does he eat with tax collectors? and sinners. Not only is Levi hosting this, this party, this dinner, there are all sorts of people who most of the time society would ignore and would not want to be with. They're all in this house and Jesus is there in the middle of them. And Jesus says these famous words, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now everyone is a sinner. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is pointing us, as he has with the other encounters, to realize our brokenness, to realize the need of salvation. Those in humility who recognize that they are sinners that they would come to Jesus. And it's those people who God delights to show salvation to. Mark is showing us here that Jesus' community, the community of the king, 
is one for outcasts, is one for sinners, one for those who need salvation. And he's doing that to rebuke the teachers of the law, those who think that they're good, those who think that they're religiously sorted, those who think that they're right with God. He's showing us, I think, what the church should be like. Not people who think that we have everything sorted. Not people who look like we're, we're on TV or on a stage where everything is we're all happy and smiley and acting up kind of really well. A number of you have uh, mentioned as I've come in that the Queen died in the UK um, two or three days ago. And a while ago, we celebrated her Jubilee. There was a big party. And on TV, there were lots of famous people, film stars, musicians, all the people who were on TV. They all looked really good. They all spoke really well. They all had, they looked very tidy. They were dressed really well. That's what you expect from that kind of event. What you expect from a, a gathering for somebody like the Queen. There weren't any homeless people. There was no people in their hospital beds dying. There was no one who was a bit awkward, who can't express himself uh, very well. That wouldn't be great TV. It wouldn't be a great way to celebrate kind of a national event. But church is the opposite of that. Jesus uses the image of being a doctor. Jesus who has come as the great doctor for us. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's those who are ill. The church is a hospital, not a stage. Each of us are and sick in different ways. Each of us needs the Dr. Jesus to work in us and to help us. But so too, all of those people who, who aren't here, the people we would long to be here and worshiping, people who see us out us, people who might be seen as us by others. People with various needs in different ways. People who might be enemies. Is the doctor for them. In closing, how do we view this? How do we respond to what Jesus and his community is like? Well, if we're those this morning, perhaps you're you're not sure about Jesus. Perhaps you're kind of You've heard a lot about Jesus, but you're not clear on what he, why you should follow him, why you should listen to him. And I encourage you to think about the fact he is the doctor. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to give you things that will benefit you, but they may not be the things that you think you need. He wants to give you salvation and give you full, the fullness of life that comes in that. If we're those who are following Jesus, we need to make sure that we're those who are welcoming others in in the same way that Jesus did. We need to be thinking about the fact that we ourselves were outcasts, that we ourselves were in need of a doctor, and that though we are more healed than we were, we're still not perfect. We still need to go to those consultations with our doctor. We still need the prescriptions that our pharmacist is going to give us. We still need to continue to come to Dr. Jesus every day until he makes us full and well in the new creation. We need to remember that ultimately all of the salvation that Jesus offers us is by his grace. I think one of the great examples of this, the guy who's lying down, Jesus heals him he does not do anything to be healed. Levi did nothing to be welcomed by Jesus. Jesus calls him before Levi can do anything. It is by Jesus' grace that we receive any of this. But it is not cheap. We receive it through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The leper in that first story didn't make his sacrifices. 
he didn't he disobeyed and didn't go to the temple he didn't offer the sacrifices that you need to when you've been healed from leprosy but the good thing for that leper is that jesus did pay his sacrifices jesus died on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice he died on the cross as the lamb of god to allow people to enter into his community and so even if that leper in some ways was disobedient that he was saved through the death of the Lord Jesus. The king's community is one for outcasts. It's one for sinners. It's a community that points to and offers salvation. It's a community that looks to Jesus in all things. I think it should make us a people who love the least lovable, who love our enemies, who pray for them, who show them compassion. As we do that, we point them to Jesus' sacrifice. There will be things that people do that we dislike. There will be things that people do that we think are wrong. The same was true of Jesus. But what he does is as he shares his love and grace to them as he goes and spends time with them. He points them to where they can be changed. And Jesus changes and transforms them as they come to him through the cross, his resurrection, and by the power of his spirit. So as I end, I pray that you'd remember that this is a community for outcasts, and we have all been outcasts. It's a community for sinners, and we are all sinners. It's a community for those who need healing, and we all need healing as we come to Dr. Jesus. May we offer that to one another. May we offer it to our broken world. May we look forward to the fulfillment of all things as Jesus brings all of this to an end in his new creation. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that your son, the Lord Jesus, is the great doctor. We thank you for offering each of us your salvation. Thank you that whether we trusted you from childhood or whether we came to you later in life, that you offered us your grace freely and lavishly. But we're conscious that we need your continued medication. Let us be those that regularly turn to you in prayer, in reading your word, in coming to church, in fellowshipping with other Christians, that you would give us your medicine, that we might continue to live for you. We pray, Father, for our hearts where they have grown hard to other people, that we would not be like the scribes in this passage, but we would be open like Jesus to others. And I pray for this church, Lord, that you would bless them and keep them, that others might be added to their number. This would be a community that holds out these things and shows love and compassion that points to the cross that many might be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.